do. First of all, I well, welcome to all that have joined for this uh, meeting, this Lunch and Learn session. And um, when Craig come back, <laughs> he's a special welcome to this session. And he's giving us the presentation, Advanced EOR Screening for the Norwegian Continental Shelf. And Craig is a geoscientist with a long experience in the oil and gas industry and related to R&D. He developed BP's Reservoir Technical Limits process for identifying and progressing new opportunities for increased recovery. Today, he is consultant on resource progression, risk and decision making and reservoir geology. He also holds a visiting professorship at Imperial College London, where he researches EUR, reservoir connectivity and gas production storage mechanism. Craig has been working with the NPD for several years on EUR screening, and the screening tool has been presented on several occasions. But in today's presentation, Craig will focus a bit more on the results from the second phase of the screening, when operational, environmental and economic factors were included. The presentation will last for about 30 to 40 minutes, and there will be time for questions afterwards. And if you do have questions during the presentation, please use the chat so that we can revert to these uh, questions after the presentation. I can't actually see it on my own computer yet. Oh, here we go. OK, oh, finally, sorry about that. So, um, yes, we will have a look at some of the results uh, and uh, the process that we went through to get the results for the work that um, we at Imperial College have been doing with the uh, with the Petroleum Directorate, which has been very interesting. So uh, what I'm going to cover here is briefly what is EOR screening and why do we need it? I'll say a little bit about what we did to incorporate these, these additional factors, uh, operational, environmental and economic factors into the screening. So why we did that and how we did it. Um, and then I'll get on to uh, the results of then applying to uh, 85 reservoirs on the Norwegian continental shelf and what that means for potential um, EOR um, increased recovery. Uh, first of all, let me just say what we mean by EOR. So we're talking about 14 different processes, the ones that are showed in the bullet points there. So um, we have, um, as a matter of interest, can you see my, can you see my uh, pointer if I move my pointer here? No. No? Oh, never mind. Um, so uh, the first three bullet points uh, are sort of the, the, the gas-based processes. And then the next three bullet points are, are chemical processes. Then we have the low salinity smart water, which are like the but modifying the bulk chemistry uh, of the water. And then uh, the last two are um, either deep acting or shallow acting treatments um, that you might apply on a well by well basis. Um, so those are the, the processes that we're, we're including. Um, and of course, we're not including um, things like thermal or steam, which are, are not relevant for the for the Norwegian continental shelf. So, what is EOR screening, and and why why do we need it? So, if you, if you really want to understand uh, in detail the EOR potential for a particular process in your field, um, it can require a lot of of work, and you know at the very least. It would involve building quite complicated simulation models to look at the incremental recovery and then you might want to build an economic model to to look at what what this what this might mean in terms of um, com commercial attractiveness um, and that might be okay if you're looking at one process in one field but in this particular case what we're wanting to do is to look at 14 processes across 85 different reservoirs so that's 1190 different permutations so you can't do a detailed study of all of those so the idea with screening is to do something relatively quick not very detailed to try and take those 1190 potential opportunities and reduce them to a more manageable level and hopefully rank them 
to know which are the most important ones, which we can then do um, some more detailed work on. So uh, when we talk about enhanced oil recovery screening, if we look at work that has been done in the past and published, um, all of this is what you would call technical screening. And by that, what I mean is what you're looking at is the technical viability of the process, given the requirements of the process in terms of physics and chemistry of the reservoirs, and then comparing that to the actual conditions in a reservoir. Um, and let's just say that if you're thinking about miscible CO2 injection, um, if you, um, I mean, to make CO2 miscible, it requires certain temperature, pressure and oil composition. So if in your particular reservoir, you don't have that temperature, pressure or oil composition, then technically that process would not be viable. And many published studies kind of stop at that um, at that sort of, um, of point of, of making it very black or white. Either a process is viable or it's not viable. So something that we did when we were uh, developing the technical screening um, that we applied here um, is to not have it such a, a black and white sort of thing, but realise that there are all different shades of grey in between. So the idea was you look at these different uh, parameters on the right hand side, you compare them to your reservoir um, and what you do is create a screening score, whereas a, ze where a zero score would mean that it's not viable in your, your particular reservoir. A score of one would be, well, it's, it's optimal, it's just perfect. It would work great in my, in my reservoir. But there are all different variations in between that perhaps a, a process would be technically viable. You could do it, but it wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't be optimal. And therefore, you wouldn't get the full recovery increment that you might expect if it was optimal. So we, d we dev developed this process and used it as a way of screening out the things that are not viable, but then ranking the ones that are viable in terms of their technical attractiveness. So when we actually then applied that to these um, uh, 86 reservoirs on the Norwegian continental shelf, um, what we found that those 1190 opportunities or potential opportunities reduced to 683 technically viable enhanced oil recovery opportunities. So at that point, um, like two things happened. So one is that we realised that 683 is still a very big number. And, uh, you know, we need to do a bit more sort of screening to try and reduce that to a more manageable number. The other is that in having conversations with people like, for example, operators, um, what we realise that just because something is technically viable doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, because it doesn't mean it's practical to actually implement in your field. It doesn't mean that it's commercially attractive. It doesn't mean that it, it's competitive with other opportunities in an operator's portfolio. So this prompted the next stage, which is thinking about um, can we do some add into the screening process an advanced capability, which means that we can um, look at operational, environmental and economic screening criteria and use that to reduce down the number of, uh, um, of opportunities that make it through the screening, uh, but also come up with opportunities that are more robust from a practical point of view. So that's what we did. So I'm going to say something now about how we did this. I am going to speed through this without much detail. So if you want some more detail about um, uh, actually how we develop this screening uh, capability, then we do have a couple of uh, SPE papers that I'll refer to at the end <coughs> where we've got a bit more more information. <coughs> so uh, what we wanted to do then is to introduce the capability to screen for these three new things besides the technical issues. So the first is operational screening criteria. So it's trying to understand what makes an EOR pro process simple or difficult to implement in, a, in an offshore situation to a particular offshore field. 
And the second thing is for the environmental criteria, what environmental factors might make an EOR project either acceptable or not acceptable to an operator or to the general public? And then finally, <clears throat> is there a rough way that we can assess the economics um, of, a, of a particular EOR opportunity without having to go into detailed simulation? So all of this is quite challenging because this hadn't been done before and we need to, needed to, to understand what the, cr the key criteria really were and then quantify these and turn them into a framework that we could easily deploy in a screening tool. So I'm going to go through these uh, briefly through these three areas of, um, of screening criteria just to give you a flavour for, for how we did it. <clears throat> so for operational screening, which is about how easy would this be to deploy in an existing field, a particular process. Uh, we looked at top size facilities, the nature of the offshore installation, the wells and injectant supply. So just, just to give an example, um, which is the um, uh, top sides, the injection equipment and the processing equipment. If you look at the sort of little flow chart on the right hand side, um, what we did was to start off thinking, well, for a particular process, what equipment is required? So let's just say if it was miscible CO2 injection, what equipment do you need? Well, you need things like, you know, gas compressors and things like that. Uh, and then you have, well, OK, well, what equipment is already present in this particular field? Does it have gas compressors? Um, if yes, that's great. That, that reduces the complexity of introducing CO2 miscible injection. If not, it creates complexity because we, we've got to add all of this new, um, these new facilities. Um, and then we can then compare that to the, um, the sort of flexibility that exists in the existing uh, facilities. So if we needed to add in some gas compressors, say, um, would that be possible given the space and weight constraints in this particular field? If not, it would get a low score. So, so that flow diagram sort of shows the logic of, of constructing some of these screening scores, which are quite complicated. But, um, but anyway, we did this for um, injection equipment and processing equipment and also for the facilities materials, the metallurgy. Our metall is the metallurgy resistant to corrosion that might be um, an issue with CO2 related um, uh, processes. Then for the offshore installation, it's really looking at the lifetime. So we've got fields of all different maturities. How much lifetime is there actually left in the facilities uh, in the installation? Is, is there enough lifetime to realise the full EOR potential, which could take some time? Is the installation type? Is it like fixed, floating, subsea or whatever? Because that also affects the complexity of trying to introduce a new, a new process. And then there's the location of the uh, installation. Is it in, a, in an isolated location, far away from in infrastructure, or is it in a cluster close to other fields? Um, and then with wells, um, it's about you know the current well spacing, the well positions, and how easy it would be to optimise these to get the right well spacing and the right injector positions to um, to optimise an EOR process. And, and again, there's wells materials which relates to CO2 resistance. Um, and then um, injection uh, injectant access is about uh, is specifically for gas, and it's uh, you know our, is the field. Uh, in question, is it near to a potential supply of gas for injection purposes? So that's operational screening. Environmental screening, we had three key criteria here. Um, all of this is about um, how might project approval be affected by the perceived uh, acceptability of, of the particular process. So the first criterion was um, injectant hazard. So this is looking specifically at chemicals that you might want to inject and looking at the potential harmfulness of those chemicals if they were emitted in some way, for example, spilt. Um, and this score is basically related to the chemicals. 
And then you've got emissions, which is basically looking at the probability that um, that chemicals would actually be emitted. And this we related to the kind of water handling that was occurring on uh, on each facility. And then the, uh, the CO2 footprint is a, was the third criterion, which is if you look at net CO2 emitted per incremental barrel of oil or cubic metre of oil, um, did that go up or down relative to the, the current recovery process that's being used in each field? So um, using more or less power, for example, would affect the CO2 that was being emitted. Um, and the other thing is with CO2 injection processes, um, you could have a positive effect because you could actually end up leaving some CO2 stored permanently in the reservoir. Finally, economic screening. Uh, and basically what we wanted to do is to have a way of characterising roughly the, the net present value, the MPV, and the internal rate of return, IRR, which are kind of standard industry measures, but have a quick way of trying to um, guess these or estimate these without recourse to um, uh, to any detailed simulation or economic modelling. So I'll, I'll just have a couple of slides to show you how we did this, because to, to calculate MPV, for example, you basically need a, um, uh, to do, uh, to get to get a, an annualised production volume, a production profile. And uh, the way we did that um, is, is like this. We assumed that for each process um, in, in any particular field, that the, um, the production profile would always have the same basic shape, which you could split into different elements. So if you look at incremental production rate versus time, um, you have the start of injection, and then there is a lag before you get the first bit of incremental oil. And then there is a build phase as you build production up to the peak rate, the maximum rate. Then you have a plateau and then you have a decline. Uh, and then you have a cutoff when you reach a certain uh, minimum uh, rate. And then um, that area under that curve should be the same as the technical EOR increment that we, we calculated previously. And what we did was to develop some rather simple rules of thumb um, that allowed us um, kind of simple analytical models that could allow us to correlate things like the length of the lag and length of build with various reservoir um, properties like mobility ratio, heterogeneity, well spacing and so forth. Uh, so we could calculate these for each process in each in each field. We assume that the plateau length was zero unless the, uh, there were still wells being drilled and that was based on comparison with analogues. So, that, so this is the production profile and then what we did in terms of thinking about the costs, um, I, I won't go into how we actually estimated the overall cap, capital and operating costs, the capex and opex, because it's quite complicated and there's not really time. Um, but an in, important thing is how they're distributed through time. Um, and so what we assumed is that any capex that was spent on facilities would occur during the three years prior to injection startup, that wells capex, um, so we're talking about incremental capex here compared not, not um, you know, to do with the, the field, this is just to do with implementing the EOR process, that at any additional wells capex would be spent from sometime between the start of injection and the end of plateau, and the OPEX, incremental OPEX, would occur at any time while injection was, was still occurring. So this allowed us to calculate a cash flow by looking at the income, which was the, um, the production profile multiplied by an oil price. And then the cash flow, was look, which was looking at the, the income minus the CAPEX and OPEX in each year of, uh, of, uh, in, in, of EOR oil production. So the way that that then got turned into something that we could use for screening purposes is that we had um, these various screening criteria, each of which was given a score for operational, environmental and economic, uh, for these economic criteria. 
And then what we did with these individual criteria, we weighted them because not, not all of them are equally important. And from that generated for each EOR process in each field, an overall operational screening score, an overall environmental screening score and an overall economic screening score. And what we could then do is to use those, define threshold values for those scores and, and use those as, as kind of filters so that we could filter out thing, opportunities that didn't meet those requirements and allow ones that did meet those requirements to pass forward into, into more detailed analysis. So by doing that, the 683 technically viable opportunities that we had ended up being 372 which are also practically viable. Uh, so we reduce them by about half. And the um, also the product of these different screening scores, we could also um, use as a kind of feasib feasibility factor, um, which is a way of judging the, um, uh, the potential for a project to actually get approved. So things with a very high score there should be few barriers to getting something approved. Things with a low score would be more problematic. So I'm going to move on now to uh, just talking about the results. And this is all based on um, various assumptions that you can see there about the th these th setting these thresholds um, uh, for the um, for you know how you judge viability. Um, and I'll come back in a few slides time to talk about the sensitivity of these assumptions. So one thing we wanted to do is to assess the overall incremental EOR potential for the for the Norwegian continental shelf. And uh, we discussed with colleagues in the Petroleum Directory what was the best way to do this. And what we came up with is um, sort of as, as what we thought was like reasonable, but a little bit on the conservative side, perhaps was to assume that only one process could be applied in each field. So in a way that's hopeful because perhaps not every field, you know, you might do an EOR project on. But on the, on the other hand, there are some fields that you could do more than one process on and get a bigger increment. So, so this assumption is like somewhere in, in between those two extremes. So if you look at just the technical screening, on the left hand pie chart there, what you can see is uh, that uh, we come up with a volume of about almost 700 million cubic metres, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, and you can see from the pie chart the different processes that are um, that make up that 700 million. So bearing in mind, these are just the, um, the top process per field in terms of the incremental oil that pass the various filters. So for technical screening only, you can see that the, the biggest one there is low salinity polymer. Uh, I should mention that the, in this presentation, these colors are always the same for different processes. So that light blue is low salinity polymer. polymer. Then you've got gray, which is um, CO2 miscible, a kind of orangey color, which is hydrocarbon miscible, uh, a yellowy color, which is surfactant polymer, a dark blue, which is low salinity on its own, green which is gels and then a purple which is alkaline. Um, so that's just the technical screening. If you then add in the operational and economic screening but not the environmental screening you get the middle pie there. So you get 344 million cubic meters as the overall increment um, and uh, you so you've lost about half of the, um, the total increment from that screening. Um, but the interesting thing is you'll see that the processes flip around a little bit. So um, the um, so all of the processes processes have decreased a little bit in their potential. But relatively, what you see is hydrocarbon miscible um, flips to the top position, and that um, and also that low salinity on its own kind of moves up the the ranking. But um, high, uh, but uh, CO2 miscible and surfactant move move down a little bit, and you can also see that there's a little a little bit of polymer, the red um, bit at the top there. 
if you then add in the extra filter, the, the environmental filter, um, then we reduce further to about 280 million cubic metres. So this screens out then about in overall about 60% of the volume from the um, from the technical screening. And you, but you can see that the, the relative order is fairly similar to, to that middle pie. The, the thing that changes is that the thing anything that involves chemicals gets less. So you'll notice the uh, low salinity polymer, which is the light blue, reduces. Um, and you'll notice that surfactant, which is the yellow, and polymer, which is the red, disappear altogether. So an interesting thing here then is if you compare the two right hand pies, the difference between those is, is about 60 million cubic metres. So if you could actually find some surfactants and polymers that were benign environmentally and that everyone accepted was OK to use, then you could potentially move from the right hand pie to the to the middle pie and um, get an extra 60 million cubic metres or so. So there's clearly quite a prize for, for doing that. So let's look at some of the assumptions in this. Um, so one of the big assumptions is that all of this was done at, at $60 a barrel, which was um, was fine at the time when we did the study, but is perhaps not fine now. So um, on this next slide, what we've got is a um, is a tornado chart of uh, looking at the sensitivity to some of the different uh, inputs. So the the base case, the line running down the middle of that is is the uh, 282 million cubic meter case from the from the previous uh, slide, and the uh, the bars to the left and the right are the impact of the various low and high cases for the different assumptions. So looking at oil price, which is the second one down, you can see it does have quite an important impact. So um, as I said, the base case was 60 dollars a barrel if you moved it up to 80 dollars a barrel you get an extra 30 million cubic meters if you um if you went down to 40 dollars a barrel you'd lose about 75 million cubic meters so but still you'd have more than 200 million cubic meters of overall potential so i mean it doesn't, doesn't destroy it completely uh but it Obviously, it would be better if the oil price was higher. Um, the biggest impact on there is is the low and high case assumptions related to recovery factor. So I won't go into this, but what we did for each recovery, uh, for each process, we defined sort of maximum and minimum uh, range of, of potential recovery. Um, and uh, that has quite a, a big impact. But I, I should just say that the, uh, the low and the high cases shown here are quite extreme because the low case assumes that the low recovery case comes in for every single process um, and the high one assumes that you get the high case for every single process which is not you know not very likely to happen in reality we, we might have underestimated some and overestimated others and they might might cancel out a bit uh, you can see the other assumptions that we had about um, where we put different screening thresholds um, have a certain amount of downside. Um, the the interest rate, which affects the the NPV, doesn't have a, a massive impact. And surprisingly, the well cost doesn't have a, a very big impact. And I, I pondered about this for a while and realised that um, uh, there's, a, there's a good reason for that. In in that in this particular analysis, we're only looking at the top opportunities per field. And what I realised was that that very often the top opportunities per field are the ones that don't require a lot of new wells. So so that's why in this particular um, way of looking at things that the well cost doesn't look um, it doesn't look as though it's as important as you might expect it to. The so what have we been looking at so far with those pie charts for example is the, the assumption that only one process could be implemented in each field. What we're doing on this slide now is forgetting that, just looking at every process and how it might apply to every field 
and looking at what the total opportunity set might be for each process. So this is great for comparing the importance of different processes, but it's not very good for um, thinking about volumes because the incremental oil recovery that's the vertical axis on this uh, on this diagram is a bit meaningless because it involves uh, processes that are competing with each other and that you could never possibly do all together. So you don't need to really think about the volumes. It's, it's really the relative heights of these different uh, columns here that's important. So we've got two sets of, for all of the different processes, we've got the blue columns, which are the, the volumes from incremental volumes from technical screening only, and then the sort of ready coloured um, columns to those that include the operational, environmental and economic screening. Um, and well, there's various things that you can see from this. One is that the, the practical screening reduces the increment in all of the processes to some extent, but it is very variable from process to process. So you can see, for example, hydrocarbon miscible, the one on the far left, reduces a little bit. But then if you look at low salinity polymer, which is in the middle there, big technical inc increment, but almost half of it disappears um, with the advanced screening. Also CO2 emissible, polymer, nitrogen, surfactant polymer are all quite strongly hit, particularly surfactant polymer. And you'll notice that surfactant disappears altogether. It's screened out completely, uh, particularly by the, uh, the environmental and economic uh, screens. So um, what this tells us is that that uh, most processes have got um, some potential, um, apart from possibly surfactant. Um, and it shows us something about the relative importance of these um, sort of on a, on a regional scale. Um, I, I'm not going to say much about this slide, but what this, what this is, is the top 30 individual opportunities. So by opportunity, I mean applying a particular process in a particular field, uh, ranked in order of incremental volume. And um, the, the bars on that chart are the sort of the low and the high cases for recovery factors. So it's an, an idea of the, the uncertainty in, in the amount of incremental volume. And all of the opportunities on here pass all of the technical and operational and um, the practical screening parameters. Um, you'll notice that these are that the field names are, are anonymized uh, for confidentiality reasons. Um, but there are a couple of things that you can get from this. Um, one is we've got the top 30 opportunities here and all of them have a, um, a mid case incremental volume of more than 20 million cubic meters. So, so that there's you know a rich vein there of, um, of opportunities that could be gone after. Um, you'll notice also if if you were to take the time to, to look through that sort of the, the list of opportunities there, you'll see that there were eight different processes represented. So in that top 30, the, you know, there's quite a variety of different processes that, that make it into that into that top 30. And, and the um, the uh, other thing um, is that if you look at the number of fields in there, there are 10 different fields represented. So obviously the multiple processes per field that can't all be implemented, but um, those fields tend to be the, the biggest fields. So the fields that have the, well not necessarily the biggest in terms of initial volume, but in terms of remaining uh, volume, they tend to be the fields where there's the biggest opportunity set. And finally, uh, I just want to say something about the geographical distribution um, of these results. So what we've done is to look at various sort of areas on the Norwegian continental shelf. And uh, on this diagram, um, just to make it easier, we've we've moved the Barents Sea uh, like a thousand kilometres further south. So that's the one in the top right hand corner there. Um, and just looking at the colours, bearing in mind these are the same colours that we've used throughout, you can see, uh, and all of these pies are start from the from the top and go round uh, sort of clockwise in terms of decreasing 
um, incremental volume. You can see there's lots of different processes uh, involved. Each particular geographical reason, region does have uh, certain processes that seem to come out on top. So what I want to show you now is just some ways of um, studying the data. So what I'm about to show you, it's not like any kind of official recommendations, but it's just some ideas of how we can take this data set that we've now got, this, this screen data set, and interrogate it in different ways. So one, one way that you could do this is you could look through the data and you could find clusters of fields. So what I mean by a cluster is um, a group of fields that are in the same geographical location um, which all have the same EOR process that could, could work in that. Um, and what we've done is to say that a cluster has to be bigger uh, than 50 million cubic metres. And within that cluster, each field has to be more than 10 million cubic metres. So th there's lots of different ways of doing this. This was just an assumption. But if you do that and then look, at, look across at the, the data set, those stars, the white stars, show where clusters might um, uh, might exist. So there are some things there that, you know, for example, make sense. So if you look in the at the bottom pie chart there, you'll see there's a, a, a star in the kind of dark blue colour, which is smart water. So this is saying, as you might expect, that with smart water, there's quite a lot of potential down there in the in the chalk fields. Um, and, you know, there are other things that might be more surprising. So the the um, in the pie chart in the, the sort of the, the top middle, which is the, the Norwegian sea, um, you can see there's a star in the purple um, pizza slice, which is alkaline. So you actually have a, a cluster of fields with alkaline potential up there. So this is this is a way. The idea is that if you've got a cluster of fields, you might be able to share facilities and, and to generate some kind of economies of scale which would make, make thing it easier to implement an EOR process. So this is a way of sort of homing in on, on where there's uh, places that are more attractive. One other thing that uh, we could do is to use the operational screening score to look at the places where you've got fields with the least barrier, operational barrier to, to implementing a new process. So this is where the implementing a new process would involve the least amount of change to facilities, if you like. And those are represented by the yellow stars. Um, and if you've got places where you've got both a white star and a yellow star, um, then that's really good because what that means is you've got a group of fields for economies of scale and those fields are quite, um, will be quite receptive to a new process potentially. So. Like I say, this is not any sort of final interpretation, but it's really trying to illustrate the way that we can uh, process the data to look at sort of uh, trying to identify the best places to, to implement EOR or perhaps to, to pilot EOR. Because one thing about a cluster is you might be able to pilot um, in one field in that cluster, and that might raise confidence um, in applying the same process for the rest of that cluster. So that might also save a bit of, um, uh, of cash. So just to summarise, um, I've talked to you about this new frame framework that we've got for EOR screening, which includes these uh, operational, environmental and economic uh, criteria. Um, it seems to be quite effective in terms of reducing the total number of opportunities to, to the most important ones. And what we think is the ones that make it through all of that screening are not just technically viable, but also practically more robust and more likely to happen. Um, so I, I think that's really um, all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening to me and apologies again for the slow start. If there is any more information that you would like on any of this stuff, we have got a couple of SPE papers which are just advertised uh, on the slide there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Um, so I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if there are questions, please raise your hand and we can have a question. 
Marte Björn. Eh uh, Björn Matra, I think. Um, Björn Matra, unnskyld Björn. <laughs> right. Um yeah, I I wonder um have you uh benchmarked the sort of incremental reserves and and profiles that the screening tool give? And and how have you gone about that for the more exotic processes like surfactant flooding and yeah. where, where there's very sparse um, uh, field data? Uh, well, that's a, a very good question. And um, so basically, what we what we did was to um, was to look at we well, we looked through a lot of literature, um, both published and unpublished. You know, like a masters. Um, theses and things like that um, and you're quite right that there's there's not a lot published on many of these processes and also um, a lot of the stuff that is published is onshore with uh, much smaller well spacings and things like that so um, so this does require quite a lot of um, imagination shall I say so um, what we did was to basically look at the available data and divide it into sort of three categories. So one is if we if we've actually got real production data from a from a published or unpublished source, um, which is has the highest sort of weighting in terms of uh, benchmarking. Um, but then um, there are some processes where there's not really any field data, but there is quite a lot of lab data, uh, which obviously requires a bit of um, uh, well, like I say, imagination of how you might apply that at the field scale, but at least it is some real data. And then the, the sort of next level is where um, you've got uh, perhaps simulation data, where, where things have been simulated. Um, so basically, we included all of those different types of data for trying to benchmark the, um, uh, the recovery increments. Um, in that order of priority, um, but you're, you're quite right that you know the um, whereas some of these processes, so I might think of hydrocarbon miscible is is one where you know there is quite a lot of data, um, and but then you look at something like surfactant polymer offshore, the 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 benchmarking data are, you know, you're going to be looking at um, at lab data and simulation rather than real offshore um data uh, production data so that that all has to be taken account that uncertainty has to be taken into account in the analysis and what you would well what you might have seen if you look very carefully um is that where we have things that, that have um where the benchmarking data are less um reliable that we have a, a much wider range on that Remember, we have a low case and a high case for recovery factor. Those processes that are less well constrained ha have a wider range of uncertainty on them. Thanks for that question. Thanks. Any more questions? Um. Knut Ulleberg. It's maybe a bit follow up to what you were discussing now, Greg. Um, and I'm a bit surprised to, to see the quite large difference between polymer and low cell polymer. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, are there any field tests or data to actually substantiate that? Because that comes out as the number one non-gas related EOR method, right? Low salinity polymer does, yes. It, uh, well, certainly oh. from, a from a technical point of view. But the thing so, is, it relates so, to so, so is the big difference between polymer and low cell polymer, is that recovery efficiency or is it reduced OPEX due to less polymer? What, what, what's the reason why low cell polymer comes um. so high? I, I think it. I, I think there's two there's two competing things here, and um, I mean to answer this question properly, I'd have to sort of go go back into the data and try and um, 
figure out exactly what's going on. But what, what I think it is, is, is like two competing factors, is that there is a, a higher recovery increment from low salinity polymer compared to polymer on its own. But that there are two negative things. One is that there is the additional cost of the of the polymer, um, which adds to the operating cost. And then the second thing is the um, the fact that 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 the polymer gets hit by the environmental screening. Um, so I, I think th those are the factors. Does does that answer your question? I hope it does, because that's the best you're going to get. <laughs> Let me go for the next one. That's Roar Kjeldali. Thanks, Craig. Uh, great overview. Um, is it possible for you to comment on the alkaline method that clustered in the Haltenbanken area and, and say something more about that? What's driving that? Um, well, that's... <laughs> That's a good question. I, again, I, I, I don't have all of the numbers for all of the fields in my in my head. Um, but um, I think the thing the thing about alkaline is it's it has some of the um, characteristics of surfactant, um, but generally for a lower cost and also uh, for doesn't carry the same uh, sort of um, environmental negative um, connotation that the um, that this factor has so that that's why um, why alkaline appears in in some places it's because it is advantaged by certain situations where um, uh, where other processes might not work or might be might be too expensive um, but I, I can't think why um, I, I can't think why the um, um, what it is specifically about the, uh, the Norwegian Sea that um, uh, that makes alkaline look so good there. But I, you know, if the petroleum directorate would allow me to, I could um, extract some data and. Um, uh, and uh, I'll let you know. But thanks, thanks for the question, Roa. That's uh, nice to hear from you after all this time. Yeah, the same. Uh, thanks for a good presentation again. Um, the next question is from uh, Sharam Pur Mohammadi. Yes, uh, thanks, Craig, for a very interesting screening and uh, nice presentation. My question comes to uh, in many of, uh, well, what you have basically assumed here is that the EOR will be implemented as a tertiary uh, implement implementation when it comes basically in, uh, in NCS after uh, water or um, gas injection or both. But uh, my question is that, I mean, or a comment basically is that in many cases in the past and maybe uh, still there are some field under development or marginal fields, that could have been this implemented as a secondary, which in some cases could lead to even a better result than the EOR. So if that could have been looked into, could have been, I think, improved the even better potential than what we see here. That that is that's a good observation, and and what you say is 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 right. We did try to take some account of this um, in the technical screening although it may not have been um, by any means perfect but what we did was one of the one of the screening um, um, one of the technical screening criteria that we used was the um, um, the um, the previous well, the, the current recovery process so if the current recovery process was water flood or if the current rep uh, recovery process was um, uh, like um, pressure depletion, you know, with no no in injection, um, that there would be a different. Um, well, basically, if there was water water flood, there would be a slightly lower increment. It, it was taken account of in the um, 
in the calculation of the technical recovery factor increment. So we would have taken that into account to some degree, but whether it was done perfectly and really reflected the additional volume that you might get for, for applying these in a secondary mode, I, I'm not sure. Possibly we, had, we would have underestimated that. Thanks. The next question is from Zayed Fala. Hello, uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Greg. I have a question about the uh, screening parameter. Uh, and I was wondering for some of the fields, we uh, we might uh, <clears throat> let's identify a field for, uh, let's say, miscible gas injection, but we might not have available gas or enough available gas for that particular field. Mm -hmm. So out of curiosity, uh, just for myself, is that do we have enough injection fluid or injection gas if you look into, uh, let's say, regional um, overview? So, for example, if you could link your analysis to the data that you get uh, from NPD, the production data, mm -hmm. how much gas and, uh, let's say, the other material is available? So, again, that's a good question. I, I think we did kind of take that into account because one of the, uh, you might remember that one of the um, uh, criteria, that one of the operating criteria that we used was um, was gas supply um, or in injectant supply, it was actually called. Um, and what we did there was uh, for each field, first of all, we, we had as part of the input data set, we had the size of the gas cap in that field, if there was one. So um, we could figure out um, how much gas would need to be injected and then compare that to the size of the gas cap in the particular field. But and so if there was a big gas cap, then it would get a good screening score for injectant supply for um, for gas injection. Um, but then what we also did was to look at fields within a, a 50 kilometer radius and looked at the sizes of the, uh, of the of the amount of gas in those fields. Um, and so if if there was if the, the, the actual field that you were were evaluating didn't have much gas, but there were a lot of um, gas gas rich fields round about, then you might not get a perfect score, but at least you wouldn't get a zero score because you'd, it would be possible you might think to to source gas from from nearby. So that so this was this was taken into account to some degree, but again, this is a screening study, so nothing's perfect. It's trying to make some simple rules of thumb. Thanks very much. I should just mention, I mean, it, it might be kind of obvious, but I should just mention that um, all of this is based on a huge amount of input data. Um, and a lot of the field specific input data is was provided very kindly by the uh, by the operator who answered quite a complicated um, questionnaire sent out on our behalf by the Petroleum Directorate. So um, it may be that some of the people listening here actually had the, um, the pain of having to fill out those questionnaires. So thanks on behalf of everyone for doing that. It was it was very useful. So, Knut, did you have a follow up question? I'm sorry, that was just a lazy hand. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. So I think we can finish up here. Um, Craig, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and thank you for all the audience for joining us today. Yes, thank you very much to everyone for listening. Bye bye. OK, bye. All right, thanks.